Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. So I'm joined here at the studio by an old friend of the program, uh, Diane Colbert. Good to see you again. Thanks, Tim. Great to be here. Great to see you again, too. Now, you were obviously heavily involved in the, the No campaign in your uh, local town of, of Ballarat. I, Because it got pretty toxic uh, during around about uh, September, and I was so thankful that I was over in uh, New Zealand covering their uh, general election. So... I think I missed the the worst uh, parts, including when mm. uh, Tony Abbott got uh, headbutted, and then there was that uh, that sign that was unveiled at the Australian Christian Lobby, burn churches, something like that. Mm. Yeah, um, that's right. There was a lot of intolerance for anyone who was involved in the No campaign, and I remember I was actually spat at, I was name called, I was bullied not just me, but many, many people who were involved in the No campaign. So really, I felt like it was definitely not a fair debate. Um, you could only have one viewpoint. And if you didn't have that viewpoint, you were actually really harassed and bullied for thinking differently. We'll just talk a bit about the the politics of Ballarat for, for those who uh, are not familiar and not from uh, Victoria. I actually lived there myself for, for three years and reg it's a regional centre and most regional centres in Australia are safe Labour seats. The rural areas, that's where Liberals and Nationals hold the seats, but uh, rural uh, cities such as Ballarat, Bendigo in New South Wales, the, the Illawarra and the Hunter, they're safe uh, Labour and so it is very much uh, contrary to what some people might think, it, it, it's quite hostile to uh, the right side of politics. That's absolutely correct. In fact, in the No campaign, Ballarat had one of the highest results for the yes side, with over 70% voting yes to gay marriage. I actually had quite a few people say to me in conversations after they voted, because they got their ballot, which said, you know, respond now. There was a few people who said, if I knew now, if I knew when I sent in the ballot what I know now, and this was before the vote was even over, I wouldn't have voted yes. So I felt like, it, like there was actually a lot of misinformation from the yes campaign. You know, it's simply about two people in love. It won't change anything else. And then they started to hear about some of the other implications and they started to realise actually that was true. There were other implications that they hadn't considered. I think that the reason why the, the yes vote, not just in Ballarat, but overall in Australia, which was 61.6% of the 79% the respondents, is that the... The, to, to use the phrase as they're called now, the quiet Australians had already made up their, their mind. They, they just thought, well, because uh, uh, Australians are very fair people and they thought, well, if two people want to, to get married and, and live their lives together, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's their individual choice. And obviously the, the No campaign ran ads heavily on, on television, which was not about same-sex marriage itself, was, but was about what will come after, such as Obviously, safe schools had been uh, in the in the media, but it it seemed to me because I even know this to this this day that a, a lot of their reaction from people, even because like, they're on TV all the time during prime time, they'd be like, as if that's going to happen. Like that's that that's just an unhinged opinion. And so most people mm. who were planning to vote yes weren't swayed or had any doubts. And. That's exactly, you're right, what happened. They were told it's simply about this and, you know, very blatantly, oh no, that would not happen. You know, you won't be discriminated against if you have a view that's different for your religious belief or your other other reasons. You know, you you won't have this happen. And yet we're seeing the very things, less than two years on, we're seeing the very things that they said that would never happen happening and in fact some of them had already happened but people were unaware that those things were happening already 
I actually don't think the Yes campaign did actually much to, to win it because it was pretty much the, the ultimate unlosable one. They, they, they couldn't lose, though they did lose some votes with some of the, the, the backlash, but it just showed the, the monumental tasks somebody like you had. You were just in your own uh, town, at, at basically in, oh, it was about two, two to three months, the, the whole campaign, because we didn't know when it was going to happen because it was originally going to happen, it was going to be a full plebiscite in February 2017. That didn't, legislation didn't pass the parliament, so it was put on the back burner. Then uh, there were some uh, Liberal MPs who decided to uh, try and uh, call, uh, cause a confrontation in the party room. They, they wanted a, a, a conscience vote, but that sort of put the issue back into the spotlight. And that's when Malcolm Turnbull and Matthias Cormann uh, said, we're going to go around the parliament and do uh, a postal survey by the Australian Bureau of Statistics, which didn't need legislation. It was, it was so strange there, the yes advocates, even though they were going to, to win a vote, they still didn't want the vote, which was so strange to me. And they fought it in the, the High Court trying to get it uh, struck out. And of course, the the Labor Party and the Greens and a few other the crossbenchers, they voted uh, down the, the initial plebiscite legislation, even though most of the Labor Party now is pro- LGBT and the ones who are socially conservative are just told to, to, to shut up. But that was so so strange uh, to me. But th there's still some who are even bitter that it had to be a vote. And I just, you won in a landslide. Well, I think one of the things that did happen is straight afterwards, if I'm understanding correctly, Daniel Andrews said, basically, you know, let's go after all the no voters. Um, anyone who publicly campaigned against it for the trauma they put us through in having to go through this. You know, it was like um, you could not express an opinion differently to their opinion, even though we were supposed to be having a reasonable debate, you couldn't actually have a reasonable debate because you weren't tolerated if you didn't, if you weren't part of the yes campaign. I remember the before the the voting period took place is that the federal parliament passed what they termed emergency vilification laws uh, to to make sure that uh, this uh, outbreak of homophobia wouldn't happen. Yeah, and it's it's really ironic because the ones that were vilified were generally the no campaign supporters who actually often faced you know harassment. The media misrepresented them. I, I personally was completely misrepresented in the media. Um, and they do it on purpose. Like they want to make you look as bad as they possibly can, you know. And, you know, where was the protection from vilification for anyone who was involved on the no side? There was none. So what did it involve on the ground being the, the no coordinator for, for Ballarat? Yeah, so basically... It was coordinating any of the volunteers who were involved in the No campaign as part of that, um, organising signs, organising letterbox dropping, organising standing out and, and talking to people. And so we did a bit of that. We also chose to speak to the local council because we were concerned that the council was representing one side of the vote. Were they the, one of the ones that put up the rainbow flag or had a motion in council to support same-sex marriage? Yeah, so, so the rainbow flag was flown for quite some time in Ballarat during the campaign. It was brought down for an event and then the Yes campaign fought to have that put back up until the end of the debate, which they actually lost um, in council the vote. Um, it was a tied vote and then the mayor at the time voted against putting the flag back up. They said simply, you know, you've had the flag up. The no campaign hasn't been represented. It's not fair to force this on them. And the mayor had actually been personally threatened. If you don't put the flag back up, we're going to do this to you. And they spoke about that, you know, that they're not going to be putting the flag up simply because they're being bullied to. And it was actually wrong for the Yes campaign to be bullying them to put the flag up. And it's 
Well, it's pretty much a cultural flag. You're supposed to have at council buildings flags which have some direct association with Australia as a nation. Well, to me, a flag also represents what you give authority to. You know, a flag is about this is an authority over us. So the Australian flag, we have the Australian government. It represents that we're under the Australian government, that we're a nation um, under the constitution. The Aboriginal flag, you know, that has meaning and significance about being under certain culture. So every flag that you choose to high choose to raise, it actually has significance about saying, I support this. 40% of Australians did not support the vote because they have concerns. And, you know, we're not raising the family flag and there is a family flag to support those 40% of Australians. Well, I think that's really unfair. Now on the, the day, it was Wednesday, the, the 15th of November, uh, 2017 at, at 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern Daylight Savings Time, the, the Chief Statistician of the Australian Bureau of St Statistics, uh, David uh, Kalish, he uh, got up at a press conference. Uh, I was quite amazed, this is just an aside, that there was no breach, uh, f leak from the, the ABS in advance. Not even the politicians knew what result was coming. And he took about, it was about seven minutes with his opening spiel, basically to take advantage of the spotlight to promote the Bureau of Statistics and <laughs> how we were uh, pleased to conduct this survey and everyone was just, get on with it. And he eventually did get to it. I was actually on the air with uh, Dave Pello uh, doing a live stream at the time because whenever there's a big uh, election result on, that's that's what I like to do. And uh, Dave Pello actually beat uh, David Kalish because the Australian Bureau of Statistics website published the results, I think about 30 seconds before he announced the results. <laughs> and so Dave Pello basically, he he spoiled, well, for our viewers, the, the announcement. But yes, he announced the 61.6% the, the yes vote, which was 7.8 million yes votes and 38.4% no votes. Uh, which was 4.8 million no votes. And it was broken down the the yes, no vote only by federal electorates because that's how the, the politicians wanted it. And of course, what was immediately noticed is that it was, or what has been Labor's heartland in, in Western Sydney, which is a very multicultural area. They had the highest no votes in, in the nation. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting was a politician was told, look, if your area supported the yes vote, you have to vote yes. But if people were in an area with a high no vote, they were expected to vote yes anyway. Well, Labor, these Labor politicians, their justification was, oh, we didn't want the vote anyway. We wanted a conscience vote. We were going to vote yes. So the, the end result doesn't apply to us. It only applies to the politicians who lobbied for uh, the vote. That was that was their explanation. So people like Jason Clare and Chris Bowen and uh, Julie Owens, uh, Tony Burke, uh, they could get away with their electorates voting no and uh, vote yes uh, on the final vote. Well, I also understand from having spoken to a couple of Labor politicians that they were pretty much told that before they could run for that specific federal election, they had to say they agreed with same-sex marriage and they actually weren't allowed to re-nominate as a politician unless they agreed with it. There was, in the upper house, there's quite a few conservative Labor senators. There's Helen Polly, there's Jacinta Collins, there's Deborah uh, O'Neill. Uh, they either, or of course, Don Farrell as well, uh, I think there was one or two that voted no, the rest uh, abstained, but they were very quiet uh, during the, the campaign. Well, you can imagine the enormous pressure if you're told if you don't agree with this, um, you really can't renominate as a politician. So then the pressure, if you actually did have a conscience that you didn't feel it was right to actually not say anything. What people have probably forgotten there's Labor at that time still had a free vote but 
what uh, the Labor Shadow Cabinet did is that they bound all Labor MPs to vote down every amendment, and it was only the final marriage vote, which was a free vote, which obviously, if if it's supposed to be a free vote on same-sex marriage, shouldn't it be about all the, the legislation or amendments before it? Absolutely. And it's the same quite often, you know, they say, we're giving you freedom, but you have to vote certain way on all the amendments. Well, that's not real freedom, is it? Well, it did uh, overwhelmingly pass the parliament uh, in the end. Uh, all the amendments uh, failed. And of course, when it passed the, the House of Representatives, there was just four on the on the no side and I can't over a hundred on the, the yes side. And then there was the big clap. And, and a few who walked out and didn't vote. Yes. Uh, Tony Abbott, uh, he, uh, he, he abstained. So did Kevin Andrews, Michael Suka, uh, Andrew Hastie, George uh, Christensen, or their, or their electorates uh, voted yes. They didn't, th uh, or obviously they didn't want to go against their electorate and vote no, but they didn't want to violate their own conscience. So they thought the best thing they could do is abstain, which is not what the Labour MPs in the lower house did. That yeah, that's true. Uh, it seems to me now that the issue of two years later, same sex marriage is is settled. There's there's not many. Obviously, you still hold the traditional view of marriage, but that topic as a debate, it's it's been accepted. Basically, it's just how Australia is now. The the debate has now turned to because the the radical LGBT activists and I've I don't believe they represent all LGBT people. There's a lot who just want to quietly live their lives, and there's mm -hmm. a lot who are just satisfied with with same sex marriage. But they're yep. the ones who lobbied the the politicians, and this is what the the no campaign was was warning about these these other things and. Uh, Marriage Alliance, which was one, which was part of the the coalition for for marriage, that was that, that was founded by Sophie York. She used to be in the Liberal Party. Uh, now she, oh, she was a strength and service candidate, and I believe she's working with Ricardo Bossi on his Australia One party. Uh, that organisation changed to Binary Australia, which is now run by Kiralee Smith, who used to run Hello Choices. But this is. Oh, she believes that this is quite an important area and uh, binary as the word suggests it's basically uh, uh, trying to educate the public and well lobby the politicians to retain that there's two genders which well that was science for and biology for forever but of course we've seen what well, the worst example was in Tasmania where uh, gender is now removed from birth certificates and that's an opt-in and of course they they still retain medical records which have biological gender but it's not on the actual birth certificate itself and we had passed in victoria uh, where a person just by themselves can can change their gender from male to female male, male female to male male to female yeah, and to do it every year if they so choose. Yes, or they can change it to something else as as long as it's not uh, obscene. Yeah, and you know what's really interesting about that is they say that you can't change, right? That, for example, if you're homosexual, you're born that way and you can't change. So if that was true, right, your gender identity is innate and unchangeable, then why would you need a provision to change your birth certificate every year? If, if your gender is innate and unchangeable. I don't know why they set it up like that. Yeah, and to me, there's so many contradictions yeah. in what is being pushed um, to form legislation. You know, if our gender is fluid and changeable, then why can't someone change from homosexual to heterosexual if it's fluid and changeable? Well, it's not... I would argue there it's not recorded on any government document. Well, it shouldn't be. Your sexuality, it's not... Well, there's been a bit of controversy in that uh, on the 20 uh, next census uh, that uh, they've removed the sexual orientation question or the LGBT people are quite upset about that because they won't get to get statistics on their representation. But yes, it's... 
it's not needed for, for or it shouldn't be needed for government records, maybe for, or maybe it's appropriate for your doctor to, to know, but that, but that's about it. Well, obviously your birth certificate, it has a gender recorded, but yes, where it can be changed now, as we said, to, to, to basically anything. I would have been satisfied if, because obviously to medically transition, you have to go through a doctor's approval process. I got to have been satisfied if doctors had to, to sign off on it, but this is not with these legislation, it's self-identification, which is basically you can have, well, the most famous case was that Jessica Yaniv in, in Canada who, who tried to force the uh, salons to, to wax their balls. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty horrific when your feelings now dominate instead of biology. And, you know, the science is pretty clear that there are thousands of differences between males and females. You know, even the way we see and the way we hear is different. You know, we have differences biologically. That's why men are more likely to be colorblind. It's simply because we have different eyes, you know, but we're ignoring all of that for an agenda that has been set by a few radical activists. And do you know, this science is really important because it actually determines a lot of health outcomes. You know, because boys do hear differently, you've got a, a, a woman teacher in the classroom with a higher voice as we females often do have. He can't hear so well sitting in the back of the class. Now he's getting diagnosed with ADHD simply because he's not paying attention. Now, they're not actually saying anymore, well, we know we've got some differences between males and females. Let's move this boy to the front of the class and see if that changes his behavior. Do you know? So things that can seem small and insignificant actually can be quite significant. So. I find there's a lot of doctors concerned about kids being put on drugs for ADHD and they think actually there's probably nothing really wrong with them. It's probably simply a matter of class positioning, you know. So I think we have to look at biology and take biology seriously. I, I don't think we can just chuck out what we've known about, you know, our DNA about our biology, about the way that men and women are different, equal, but different. Well, that's a whole other topic, the, the uh, pharmaceuticalization, the, the drugging of well, the, the population as a whole. But uh, children, the, the solution seems to be if you've got uh, some sort of social or mental issue that we just put you on on drugs, that's it. Well, it's billion trillion dollar dollar industry but yes that's a, that's a whole other topic now what we've seen we, we've we've got the safe schools program the the full Ros ward version of it in victoria in other states and territories it's called something else so people aren't reminded of Ros ward when they hear the term safe schools but in victoria we've also got uh, respect for relationships which as you were just talking about before, is basically trying to de-gender children, arguing that uh, gender stereotypes lead to uh, domestic violence. And I remember seeing a documentary, it was in Iceland, uh, which they, they want to achieve gender equality and they actually have schools which, which basically aim to, to, to basically tell children off if, no, uh, well, try and deprogram them from being their natural gender. So the, the boys have their nails painted and the girls do, do woodwork as a form of basically trying to fight children's natural Stereotypes or which, gender norms. Which is, like, children, like, obviously, like, they they need to be reined in when they're unruly, but in terms of what they, what they want to do for a recreational activity, they should be able to gravitate towards what they want. You shouldn't force children to engage in a particular recreational activity that's like we're, we're told that we're supposed to allow children to be themselves but if you're trying to to de-gender them that's that's the opposite yeah that's right they shouldn't be forced like you know what if a little boy wants to paint his fingernails so what let mm. him if a little girl wants to play with trucks 
So yeah. what? Let her. You know, that doesn't mean anything. It just means that they're having fun in the way that they have fun. I've heard of one case actually in Canada where a child was playing with toys that would be generally associated with the opposite sex. And what happened was the teacher said to them, you're obviously transgender. And the child actually went home really distressed because they're like, you know, mummy, I'm going to turn into a boy. And this little girl had so much distress. And when the parent went to school to talk about the distress that this created for their child, the parent was called transphobic, you know, and they didn't listen to what had happened in the classroom. And that's really dangerous to actually put into a child's head the idea that they are the opposite sex when the child actually says, no, I'm a girl, you know, and I, I don't get why they're actually pushing onto children gender dysphoria because that's how I see it. They're trying to actually convert kids who are quite happy as boys and girls and give them gender dysphoria when they do things like that. Well, if we go back to like, the medical side of transitioning, children don't go through their biological puberty until on average about 12 to 13. So if they're say a five-year-old, which uh, for example, a girl playing with a truck or a boy painting his nails, there's no need for any medical, if they are genuinely transgender, there's no, so why not just let them or explore what they, what they want? Why, why do you need to basically, to, 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 to use a, a term, put them in the binary, gender binary, that, because they're against gender stereotypes, but if a child is not in the, you know, displaying those gender stereotypes, they must be transgender. Yeah, so isn't that stereotyping? Yes. And I know um, there was some very long-term research that showed that 88% of kids who had gender dysphoria when they were young, if they were left alone, they might have had some counselling for other issues, you know, if they had some depression or anxiety or other issues, had some counselling. But if they were left alone, they naturally grew out of the gender dysphoria. And how much better for them, you know, not to have invasive treatments that could cause cancer, heart problems, lifelong sterility. And, and kids can't possibly understand the implications of the treatments for being transgender, as they call it. They can't understand what this would mean for their life. You know, how can a child give informed consent to, I might never be a mum or a dad, I might have heart disease and die much younger. I might re get cancer from taking these drugs. You know, I, I don't get why we would push these invasive, irreversible treatments onto children. Because transgender people, they've been around for what, 50 plus years. I think the first full sex change was, or oh, it'd been early 60s, I'm just... But, Possibly earlier. Yes, but uh, so, so they've always been around. But it seems that we've lost the the balance, and that even people who like believe, or of, I I, sh I shouldn't say that, but uh, even people who like believe that uh, gender dysphoria is a medical condition that cannot be, be cured and believe that transitioning is the, the best option, it, there's, there's not an objective test anymore. It, it's, it seems to be that the, the bar is being set lower, not, I would say, by medical professionals themselves, but just by the, you, you would say, the, the child-rearing class, whether that be teachers or other, uh, other people who work with children. Well, I've heard many people say if they don't take the affirming approach, then they're in fear of losing their accreditation as whether it be a doctor or a psychiatrist. So they actually have to affirm this new thinking, but there really is no, if you look for quality research, there really is none. You know, we're really socially experimenting on kids with this stuff and it's quite dangerous. And of course we've seen, obviously, it's not just LGBT sex education uh, that uh, is in schools now, but in the US state of Illinois, they have to actually learn about LGBT 
history. They have to learn about the whole history of the the movement. And then we've probably seen well, the most abhorrent uh, aspect of, well, uh, it's basically child abuse with drag story time, which I always saw drag performers, they're adult entertainers. They make these crass sexual jokes, which obviously some adults think is funny, but do, where did this idea come from that they, they read to children? That's what, and why does basically, it, se it seems like every story time these days at the local library is a drag story time. There was one in Melbourne back in May, there was one in Perth. Where did this concept come from because well i'm still relatively young this is completely foreign to, to me and to many people and i think it's an interesting point you make about the lgbtqi history because i think it's a really unbalanced history that is taught like if people knew the one of the first transgenders dr john money did a surgery on a little boy who became David Reimer eventually, right? And if we actually really taught LGBTQI history, we'd know that a lot of the thinking is based on fraud. Well, that was uh, John Money. That was, he was basically running a human experiment because uh, David Reimer was, didn't have gender dysphoria. It was an unfortunate circumcision accident which burnt off his male genitals. And so, Dr. John May thought, hey, this would be a good... Yeah, that, yeah, well, he was one of two boys, mm. and so it was the perfect opportunity for him to prove his theory that male and female was social conditioning, not actually biological, and that's what he tried to do. But unfortunately, he wrote about it as a success right up until the point where David, who was called Brenda, at one point, because of the huge psychological issues, his parents knew they had to tell him the truth. And when they did, he was like so relieved because he didn't understand why he felt so bad about being a girl and, mm. you know, why his life was so difficult. And really tragically in the end, both David and his brother suicided because of the treatment that they had received at Dr. Money's hands. No, most people will never learn that in the LGBTQ history, and yet that is the beginnings of the transgender history, and we need to be aware of the risks as well. Yeah, it's a horrible, tragic story, and Dr. John Money, basically he's pure evil for what he did to, to that family because the, the parents are still alive, both their, their children are, are dead. It's, it, I, when I saw a documentary on it, I was just horrified that yeah. that could happen to a family. Yeah, it's horrific. And unfortunately, Dr. Walker, who was one of the other people who has founded the World Organization for Transgender Health and Guidelines, he, I don't know if you've ever heard of Walt, Walt Heyer, but he advised Walt Heyer, clear cut case of gender dysphoria. Now we're talking about an adult, not a child in this particular yes, instance. Yes, uh, I'm aware of um, his story. Yeah. So he lived for 40 years as a, a man went through, became a woman. In the process of becoming a woman, he lost his family relationships. He became divorced. There was a lot of family trauma that happened. After eight years of living as Laura, Walt realized my feelings weren't based in being a male, uh, sorry, a female in a male body. They're based in psychological things. They're based in sexual abuse. They're based in the fact that my grandmother affirmed me as a girl and put me in a pretty pink dress. You know, he actually came to realize he'd been lied to, he'd been deceived. And I think many people are actually really angry because they don't look at psychological potential causes for gender dysphoria. And we're losing the ability and the capacity to see so often trauma does play a part in gender dysphoria. I always come at the LGBT issues as, as long as it's an informed, voluntary choice. I wish them all the best, but it seems that today where uh, th that's not, not happening. Obviously, 50 years ago, it was that choice was, was not available because homosexuality was criminalized in 
uh, a lot of the West. But now, of course, we're seeing the 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 other way where if you express something critical about the LGBT lifestyle, well, we've got before the Victorian Parliament, uh, Fiona Patton's Racial and Religious Tolerance uh, Amendment Act, which would expand uh, that uh, provision, which uh, outlaws uh, racial and religious vilification to include sexual orientation, gender identity and disability. And we're also seeing Daniel Andrews, he's already bragged about this on Facebook, uh, Victoria will be the first uh, state to ban uh, conversion therapy, which well, it's, it's basically uh, it, why they call it conversion therapy is because there's there's been a lot of horrific stories of um, camps where uh, young teenagers have been sent to and there's been a lot of religious inspired abuse, which has obviously led to a lot of mental damage. But uh, that's that's just one abhorrent example of conversion therapy. There's, and, and this again, if, if someone voluntarily and it's informed, it's a choice if they want to seek some sort of therapy for gender dysphoria and same-sex attraction, that's their choice. And obviously those, those sort of camps, they, a lot of the time they were sent by their parents, that wasn't an informed voluntary uh, choice. But it seems that because there was bad things that happened in the past, we've got to basically ban everything. And I would ask, how long ago are we talking about when we talk about these camps? You know, the, the report that he's using to base this ban on has 15 people. I'm not even sure if they're all Victorians, like we don't have that much information about it. But, you know, to say we're going to ban something based on the experience of 15 people, well, I could probably come up with a list of 100 Australians who say counselling didn't help their depression. And some of them would say it was harmful. So do we ban counselling for depression because some people thought it was harmful? Well, you can be of the opinion that it's junk science or medical quackery, but there's all these homeopathy treatments, which they're genuine medical uh, benefits are uh, very questionable, but that's they're not banned. In fact, there's some people who lobby for that Medicare should subsidise some of these. So why single out one type of medical quackery? Because a lot of these other homeopathy, well, they people spend a lot of money of them. That can be a uh, can cause mental damage. These these other types of experimental treatments but you're just singling one out there and i think also one of the issues you have is there's this prevailing spoken um it's been going on for a long time that you're born gay that it's innate and that you can't change but the problem with that is when they actually have done research there is not one study that actually fully supports that like you'll read some that say there might be a link. Uh, it's we've, we've it's it's never been uh, found out, or probably a person who is curious to sort of do a detailed thing. They're w probably worried the the trouble they might get into. But it is given that it is quite contested, and we don't know the answer. It's certainly something worth exploring. Well, I don't know if you're familiar, but there were twin studies that were done. And it was quite significant. I think it was 16,000 sets of identical twins. And what the conclusion of that study was, was that it can't actually be fully biological because if it was, all of those identical twins who had identical genes would have all been gay where it was only between 10 and 20% that were actually of the twins that were, were both identifying as gay. And so, there's actually some evidence that shows that it's not biological, that environmental and social issues do play a big factor in your sexual identity, in what you identify as a sexual orientation. So that being the case, if people want to change, they should be allowed to get the help that they want, as thousands of people across the world have had, you know, and I I think one of the things that maybe ha happens is people feel threatened by the fact that people do change. I've spoken to many of them and they want to silence the people that have changed and say, no, no, that, that, that can't be true because you can't change. But thousands of people have. 
And if you are living a gay, lesbian, or transgender lifestyle, obviously you have complete rights now to live that that lifestyle. No one's going to, to come and yell it and tell you you're a, a, a evil, demonic person. So why should it bother if so, somebody wants to attempt to, to change their same-sex attraction or a gender dysphoria? It's, it's not going to impact you. You still have your complete freedom. It's not going to be forced upon you like it would have been in the, the past, a, a conversion therapy. So if We've, we've lost what should be the, the balance, and I come back to again, that choice, informed, voluntary, and of course, free speech as well. As I mentioned, the, the new uh, anti-vilification uh, amendment, uh, is Binary Australia, is that going to be an illegal organisation soon? And are schools going to be able to teach in accordance with their values. For example, will Christian schools be able to teach what the Bible says that you are created male and female in the image of God? Or are they actually going to be stopped from teaching what's written in the Bible simply because it's no longer seen as politically correct? Yes, there's a lot of um, concerns about uh, oh, it's obviously the state of Victoria under Premier Jane Landrews uh, uh, it's obviously the, the first in the nation for, for these uh, sorts of things, but it's happening all over the uh, the Western world. So I think definitely we need to defend freedom as a general principle and also individuals' choice. And if we are a tolerant society, then we should be able to say to anyone, live and let live and mind your own business. <laughs> And I think with children, we need to be really careful because we know kids are impressionable. What you tell a child, they will generally yes. take to be truth. And you know, a child, if you've told them the tooth fairy is real, they believe the tooth fairy is real, right? Santa's real, whatever you tell them is real. For them, that's the truth. So to tell them because they have some feelings towards being the opposite sex, that they must now be the opposite sex, that's actually quite dangerous. Allow them time to process what's going on for them, allow them time to, to work through. You know, our brain is not fully developed until 24. The American Psychological Association says, don't get tattoos when you're a teenager because it's a lifelong irreversible decision. So we're not gonna let someone have a tattoo, but we're gonna let them decide to cut off parts of their body. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, certainly when we're, it's come to children, we've lost that delicacy which we should always have uh, when it comes to to children well it's been good to catch up with you again uh, diane you're still a, a free woman <laughs> i hope that i hope, hope that uh, stays the same there's this because you have lost your mental health accreditation which obviously is a what's well, a blow for for anyone who wants to or who, who basically wants to, they can't get, because you can't, they can't claim Medicare or anything uh, like that, but... Well, I've lost the ability to run the training which I had ran, run for 11 years with no complaints, you know, and I'm not the only person, like there's a lot of people who've lost the freedom of speech and freedom of conscience since the no campaign vote where they've found they can no longer either be a teacher or a, a social worker or many, many different fields of work. You know, people all over Australia have already lost their careers. Of course, we don't hear about that in the mainstream media because they said that wouldn't happen. And I think one of the things we need is we need to have a balance where we are hearing the voices of the concern genuine concern for what's happening with kids, you know, which is having a real impact on, on the rest of their lives. Yes, it's certainly, I think, as I said, we, we need to be more delicate than we are at the moment. We've, well, it's in a whole range of things we've lost rationality, but I'm glad uh, we could still have this, this conversation. And well, let's hope on the, the next anniversary, we're not discussing even more radical things that have come up. Or we're not talking from prison. Yes. <laughs>
They're talking to you from uh, the, the phone glass. <laughs> <laughs> Stay safe. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows and to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.